Now it's Archive on 4, Doctor Who, The Lost Episodes from 2009, in which Sean Lay attempts to find out what happened to the 108 episodes of Doctor Who that were wiped in the 1960s. Listen to me, both of you. This is the planet Myra, and the only beings on here are the Visions. We can't see them, but they're very vicious. We must try to get away from here as soon as possible. But how? I don't know yet. The pictures may flicker and the effects aren't very special, but we can still watch episode 5 of the Daleks Master Plan from December 1965, which ends with the Doctor in danger, trapped in a steaming swamp on the planet Myra. Daleks! You're right, Doctor. They've come. You are surrounded. You will come with us. I'm afraid, my friends, the Daleks have won. Surely not. As William Hartnell stared defiantly down the eye stalk of the nearest Dalek, 10 million viewers were left wondering how he'd get out of this one, a classic cliffhanger. At the same time the following week, they watched to find out. They did, but we can't. Episode 6 of the Daleks Master Plan is missing, along with episodes 1, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 11 and 12. As the Doctor says at the end of the story, what a waste, what a terrible waste. All, however, is not lost. We may not be able to see these Doctor Who stories, but we can hear them. Each one of the 108 missing episodes from the 1960s. I'm in Bath and I'm about to go into a BBC building. Imagine when an archaeologist digs something out of the ground, sticks it all back together and then brings it back to a museum for display. Well, this building is pretty much the equivalent in Doctor Who land of that museum. We're going to hear how the audio from each of those missing Doctor Who episodes was found and painstakingly restored, and then we'll go on the trail of those missing films. Inform the Dalek Supreme that the Time Destructor is ready for testing. Are all circuits operational? Yes, the Terranium core has been fitted. Well, with me is the man who made that recording something like, what, 43 years ago. Uh, Graham Strong, tell me the story of that. Why were you doing it? I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. I was very interested in electronics and this was a new way of recording things to play back later, um, way before iPods and audio cassettes even. I've got my mother to thank because uh, she was the one that pushed me to watch this new sci-fi series. How old were you then, Greg? Fourteen when it started. And you sat there every Saturday evening with your reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It was unusual something new. Sci-fi was not as common as it is today. Why did you want to have a recording of your own? Purely from my own personal preference of listening to it later. And did you listen back to them? I listened to some, but it's very difficult. As time goes on, you, you cannot visualise the pictures you've seen. You only have the audio. But in the early days, yes, I could sort of close my eyes and visualise the picture and listen to the story. Don't you understand? By bringing us down here, you're doing exactly what the Daleks want. Of course. He's mad. Take care, Kingdom. I could easily forego the pleasure of giving you to the Daleks. I could kill you myself. Why did you come back? This couldn't have been planned. You want to know that we come back and set you free? I'm not a fool. I guess your plan. Our only plan is to destroy the Daleks. You were both able to fool the others, but you can't fool me. Where is the old man? The one you call the Doctor. We were looking for him. Yes, of course. And that's why you came here. 
So Graham Strong sat at home in Devon in the mid-60s making his recordings with no idea that in London the videotapes were being wiped and that one day his tapes would help reconstruct the archive. Others were doing the same but very few took so much care. To start with I was recording with microphone and we had a, a 17 inch box TV at the time and I remember hanging the microphone over in front of the speaker with a, a flower pot or something on the top to keep the wire in place. And when the title appeared on the screen, I would shout into the microphone the episode title. At the time, 63, uh, I'd, I'd lost my father. He died when I was 12 years old and I was an only child, so it was just me and mother. So mother was given instructions not to come in when Doctor Who was being recorded. So mum was banished? Basically, yes. <laughs> well, we've heard the recording of that episode of a story called The Daleks Master Plan from 1965-1966 uh, period. Uh, let's pause now and hear how it sounds to people who buy it on the shelves from a, from a CD shop uh, today. I am afraid you're too late. The time destructor is activated. Do not fire! No, you cannot fire, can you? You dare not! Well, yes, you could kill us. But you would totally destroy your equipment. I think it is checkmate. Hmm? <laughs> Send one of your darlings over here. Remember, the time destructor is working, working slowly. But if you disobey me, I can accelerate it. Do what he says. Rumour has it that the managing director of BBC Television consulted his mother-in-law on Doctor Who and, hearing she had a soft spot for the Daleks, he asked to see more of them. It sounds unlikely, but then so does the idea of a teenager's recordings becoming the only record of some of those early episodes. So what happened to Graham's tapes when, eventually, they came to the BBC's attention? Well, they were passed on to Mark Ayres, a freelance sound engineer, to be cleaned up and put on CD. Before we found Graham's recordings, the available off-air recordings were really terrible. The great innovation with Graham's was that he was very careful about the way he recorded. He then, in his later recordings, had developed from microphone recordings to a line recording, which is a direct electrical connection between the television set and the tape recorder. Very dangerous back then, it has to be said. And uh, never take the back off your television. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Presumably you didn't know this at the time, Graham. I knew it was dangerous, but I knew what I was doing, hopefully. <laughs> But that was the big advantage. But what I do really is I sort of describe it as analogue archaeology. It's taking the best available recording of all these episodes, and Graham's may be the ones. Uh, we have other recordists, David Holman notably. We so there were people around the country at the same time, sitting in their homes, completely unaware of what each other was doing back in the mid-1960s, just recording these programmes for their own pleasure. The extraordinary thing is that television was very much an ephemeral thing. A television programme was transmitted and you enjoyed it. You may t maybe talked about it the following day and then you looked forward to the next episode and then that was it, you moved on. There wasn't an archival policy. The first 11 episodes of Doctor Who, for instance, still survive. After that, there's a big gap. But the remarkable thing is that right from day one, people were recording off-air audio recordings. And we have audio recordings of every Doctor Who episode, which is, I think, quite remarkable. And you two have never met before? No. No, we've never met. Extraordinary, <laughs> isn't it? We've been, I've been working on Graham's recordings now for sort of ten years, and no, we've, we've never met. But no, as I say, my job is to take all those disparate recordings and knit them together and try and create a usable master. And part of that is taking off tape noise and other artefacts. For instance, there was a story called The Abominable Snowmen, which is set in the Himalayas, and at one point you can hear a motorbike going by. <laughs> Um, which is an artefact of the off-air recording, so that I tried to take off as much as I could. So it's taking off things which shouldn't be there, and that can be tape hiss, people having tea in the background you often get on the microphone recording. So not everybody banished mum into another not room? Not everybody banished mum into the other room, no. And it's a jigsaw as well? It is a jigsaw, yes. I'm taking all the various recordings we possibly can, and then you choose the sort of overall best one, which becomes, sort of in film terms, your master shot. And then you go through and you, you patch it with other recordings where necessary. And we're marrying the professional and the amateur here. Mm -hmm. And without the amateur, 
there would be nothing for you as the professional to do. Really. Indeed, and Doctor Who fans owe people like Graham and David an enormous debt of gratitude that, as I say, we do have some kind of representation of every episode of what is, I think, a remarkable piece of television. There is, of course, a problem in following the stories with sound only. The BBC Radiophonic Workshop created wonderful soundscapes, but without pictures, sound effects and dramatic action don't make much sense. Michael Stevens, a commissioning editor at BBC Audiobooks in Bath, came up with a solution. What you need as a listener is a voice telling you what's happening. But what we were very keen on doing when we began the programme was recording sympathetic narration and inserting it sympathetically into the recordings so that you don't have people speaking over other people or speaking over important music or sound effects. And what we decided was that the narration would go in to the recording in real time. The time destructor is unharmed by the blast. Hurricane force winds spin the Daleks around out of control. As time continues to race backwards, the Daleks start to decay. Their metal casings split and melt away, briefly revealing the clawed mutants inside. What we wanted was to have a member of the original cast to actually read that narration. So, if we are talking about a 1965 William Hartnell episode, it is likely to feature, say, Peter Purvis playing the role of the companion Stephen. So we approached Peter and asked him to come and be the narrator. And Peter Purvis is one of the actors whose work on the series has mostly been lost. Yes, could that be deliberate, I wonder? <laughs> um, yes, I think all bar 14 episodes of mine have gone. I did 44 episodes in total. Most of them have gone. Some serials in their complete form still exist. I think three of them still exist. But most of the most interesting ones, the best ones, hardly anything is retained. Many well-known actors have appeared in Doctor Who. One famous name from those early days is Pauline Collins, who went on to star in Upstairs, Downstairs and Shirley Valentine. Pauline joined Peter Purvis to tell me about their missing episodes. It's sad. I understand why it happened. The BBC had storage problems with two-inch tape. Two-inch tape was very cumbersome. They wiped some to reuse, and then they started getting rid of two-inch tape because it was just too big to store. And they were running it's not bad space. if you've got... Is it 13 episodes? There are 13 episodes. To look at your young There are one self. or two complete <laughs> serials. The first one I did is there in its entirety, and the last episode of the previous serial in which I joined... Uh, is still there. Pauline Collins, your appearance in Doctor Who in 1967, mm. proportionally about the same. You did five episodes and only one of them survives. Yes, and I didn't even know about that until you told me today, nor did I know about this wonderful audio tape of it. So that's fantastic to hear that. At the time, I suppose, because, because of the whole resurgence of Doctor Who, it's become sort of even more of a cult. At the time, it was a, a lovely job with a wonderful Doctor. I adored Patrick Troughton almost as much as I adored David Tennant, had the pleasure of working with two of them. But it was a job, and I was offered to stay on as a companion for a further 39 episodes, and I thought, I'll be old if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved yeah. on, which was foolish, probably. Do you think she had a lucky escape, Peter? Oh, I don't know. It was a, it was a great fun series to do in, in many ways. It, it had its problems. And it, well, it didn't pay very well. There were all sorts of things that were, that were awful about it. But it was developing, and certainly at the time Pauline was in it, and, and in the time I was there as well, it was attracting seriously good actors to and play writers, good parts. And writers, very good writers. Which is so important. You well, know, I, was, I, I don't know if you felt the same, but I always felt that the show was very well stored led rather than character led yes. you know although billy hartnell was a very distinctive doctor and so yeah. patrick did wonderfully he yeah. never quite made it for me because i was so hooked on bill as, as the doctor. Doctors, Absolutely. Of course you so do. i've got of course two to love yes yes <laughs> but i mean i, I think there have been very good doctors and patrick's almost certainly a better actor than bill was but mm. bill was the definitive doctor for me he was fierce wasn't yeah. he i mean he, he was well, fierce. Could, be, could be yes in could every be. way <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was it was always nice to me i never never had a moment's bad time Really? Bill. Not a moment. I watched him having bad times with other people. <laughs> and I watched other people having bad times with him. <laughs> that, was, that was a regular occurrence. Well, let's listen 
Peter, at that point, to one of those missing stories from your yep. time. This is a story called The Myth Makers, made in 1965. A story set in ancient Troy. Stephen, your character, and Vicky, played by Maureen O'Brien, are observing the famous horse which has been dragged into Troy after being left outside by the Greeks. I'm pretty silly if they caught you again. And you. What do you mean? Well, if they find us together, they'll know you let me out. They think I invoke that thing. I'm all right. Yes, only so long as they think it's a gift from the gods. They'll know very differently once the doctor and company come out of it. You think he's in it? Well, it's likely, isn't it? I mean, he'll be worried about getting back to the TARDIS. He must be able to see he's got nothing to worry about. That thing is so rickety, it must be full of peepholes. Oh, right. You do better in the time they had. I wonder why he didn't delay like we asked. He must have a plan of escape to rescue us. Cyclops must have told him where we were. If Cyclops got through... Vicky has spotted Katerina moving through the crowds. That is one of Cassandra's girls. What? That girl. I've seen her with Cassandra. She's a handmaid of the temple or something. I think she must be looking for you. Look, you go back. I'll find somewhere to hide around here. Look, they trust you. You better right. go. In any case, Troilus will die of jealousy if he knows you're with me. Well, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Come off it, Vicky. The way you two are carrying on. Troilus has been very kind to me, and I'm very fond of him. And if all you can do is make me laugh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vicky. I am sorry. You better go. And if you really are that fond of him, you better tell him to get out of the city. That's wonderful. That is the original soundtrack of the show. The only additions are my commentary lines, That's fantastic. which cover the visuals. Yes. And uh, it's all because some fan sat with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in front of the television and recorded it. Thank God. And that became available. And Mark Ayers put it together, and that's the end result. And all of my episodes now exist again, Isn't although we haven't got the visuals. Do you yeah. think listening to that extract, Peter, it in any way recaptures the sense of what those 60s episodes were like? Surprisingly well, I think. I think that had real atmosphere in it. Though in some cases, the stories really did fall horribly apart. And without good story editors... It would never have happened, but good story editors managed to piece together the things that weren't as good as they might have been. And good effects. What was the Trojan Great. horse like? Do you know, I can barely remember it. And, and with no photographs and no visuals to remind me, I can't remember. Though, judging by the standards of the sets of the time, it probably was as rickety as Vicky said it was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Vicky was saying, oh, well, there was plenty of holes in that. I bet there were a lot of people. I, like, I bet there were. No, it was probably made of matchsticks. <laughs> Pauline Collins, you come along about a year or so later playing a character called Samantha Briggs. Samantha Briggs, yes. From Liverpool. I decided no, I wanted her to not be from Liverpool. Liverpool. Oh, not yes. really. She really was. And Jerry Mill, who cast me in it, who's the director, had a bit of a hard go trying to persuade Innes that, you know, we Innes was have the Innes producer. Lloyd, the producer, that he should have somebody who wasn't a middle class girl. I really wanted to play her as Liverpool because I thought it would be something different because the other companions had been, you know, a bit home counties. And anyway, eventually he did and I was thrilled to get the part. And then I can't remember, I think it was me who chose my outfit, which for those aficionados who've seen it and sent me photographs, was a kind of spotted smock with long knickers underneath it trimmed with lace and a straw boater god knows why and i think i had courage boots as well white <laughs> courage boots was anyway, the 60s i was the 60s wasn't it yeah i loved that but it was such a thrill to be in it and one of the things i remember is the very first day of outside broadcast that we did which was at gatwick airport and the story was unique in that it didn't have any kind of obvious monsters in it the monsters were the people who were taken over by the aliens and i love that kind of story mm, myself mm, i think that's mm. much more scary well let's hear how the i think it's fair to say feisty sam briggs <laughs> dealt with all the obstructions as he tried to find out what had happened to her brother brian who had mysteriously disappeared on a trip in this 1967 story called the faceless ones this is uh, sam standing up for herself when she's not getting any answers miss briggs Yes, have you found anything? Uh, well, yes, I have, but I'm afraid it doesn't help very much. Your brother definitely did get on our flight to Rome, but what he did when he got off the plane, I couldn't tell you. Well, if you can't, who can? Miss Briggs, we're dealing with thousands of passengers every week. We can't keep track of every single one. If I were you, I'd go back to Liverpool. I'm sure your brother will turn up eventually. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to close this kiosk. Thanks for nothing. 
Polly places a closed sign on the counter as Samantha returns to her seat. There's something funny going on here. Why? My brother's vanished and that lot just couldn't care less. Well, you could hear the difference between me and Annika, couldn't you? You could That she was definitely home counties, wasn't she? And she was the existing companion. She was, yes. And she was the character or the companion that Innis Lloyd, the producer, wanted you to replace. That's right. As the series was coming to an end, my five episodes, he said, you know, we'd like you to stay on and do 39 more. And I think I ran screaming for the hills, <laughs> foolish creature that I was, because I thought there'd be no surprises left in my life. And I like surprises. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I think you might, might have made the right decision. I, I, I don't know. For some people it worked, some people it didn't. Doctor Who didn't do me any favours. When I left it, I struggled. I didn't get a lot of acting work, and I don't think it was because I was particularly bad in it. I think people either assumed I was still in it or they didn't care. Maybe I didn't make much of an impact, I don't know. But after 18 months, I'd done very little other work. And uh, then I was offered Blue Peter, and my career changed, and I, I became you? something else. Pauline Collins, were you just presented with the character of Sam Briggs or did you have some input into, into her? No, I was presented with the script, but I think... I, th I suppose she was written quite feistily. You know, obviously she wasn't too gentle a character and I think I took advantage of every moment when I could make her tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pauline, let's, let's hear why Innis Lloyd might have thought you were perfect Doctor Who companion material. Okay. This is uh, Sam Briggs with the Doctor's companion Jamie McCrimmon, played by Fraser Hines, and the Doctor himself, played by Patrick Troughton, in danger. Oh, Doctor! Can't you do anything to stop it? No! Oh, wait. One thing. It's a long chance, but it just might work. Have you got a mirror in that bag? Yes! Uh, let's see. Yes, that'll do. Hand it to me. I can't. I can't move my hand. Jamie, can you take it? Have you got it? No, careful. Take it. Got it there. Right now, see if you can point it at that laser gun. Eh? The black thing on the wall. Oh, I'll try, Doctor, but why? Well, if you can reflect the light back, we've got a chance. Well, look, can't you prop it up on something? No, it won't work. I'll, but I'll you... have to hold it. Your hand. It's a risk I'll have to take. They watch until the beam is seconds away from them. Quick, Jamie, now! Jamie adjusts the mirror, reflecting the beam back onto the projector, which explodes with a flash. Oh, well done! Oh. <laughs> well, that was orgasmic heavy breathing, wasn't it? Yes. I think I probably passed out at the end of that. It's five full minutes of it. All right, then, what can I do? Did you get a good look at the man who tried to kill us? I'll stay. I have my arms around his neck. Ugh. And go down to the comedian kiosk and see if he comes in or out. Right. But be careful. Don't let him see you. Me be careful. You two watch out for yourselves. I'll be OK. You haven't heard that for 42 no. years. Uh, do you think it stands up? Oh, it's really hard to say. I don't know. I mean, I've got no idea without I seeing think the visuals. they all stand up well as, uh, as radio plays. They really do. I mean, when you hear it in its entirety, they really do work. One thing that people perhaps forget from that period of television was that although it was recorded, it was no longer being done live, you were performing it pretty much as live. We only broke recording if we had to, if, we, if it was absolutely essential. And that would be for... A special effect like the TARDIS coming and going, we would stop if we played in telecine. But that's apart from that, film that's inserts. film. That's the filmed insert. And of course, that was always a very different quality to that from the television. Mm -hmm. The television pictures were terrible at that's that time. Right, yes. Four or five lines and were the film awful. Looked great, film didn't it? Yeah. looked actually clear. You thought, oh, crikey! You know, I didn't know you could see really see what's happening on screen. I said, that's <laughs> clever. But yes, we we had to keep going no matter what. And rep training was very good for that, particularly Bill Dried. <laughs> and did he a lot? Not a lot. He got words wrong a lot. I can remember a couple of occasions when I had to leap in and feed him an idea on one occasion, I think. And my favourite one was in The Myth Makers when uh, Francis de Wolfe, who was playing uh, Agamemnon, invited Billy Hartnell into his tent. And the line, this is on the recording, his line was, Come into my tent, doctor, sit down. And have a ham bone. And he said to him, because Bill had given him such a miserable time during rehearsal and been quite awkward, and he said, Come in, sit down, ham, and have a bone. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Retake. <laughs> that didn't go out. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> what a shame. Peter Purvis and Pauline Collins.
So we have the sound, but what did happen to the pictures? Doctor Who began in 1963, and as we've heard, the early series span a period of BBC history when archiving was haphazard. It wasn't until 1978 that there was a review of archive policy and someone was appointed to choose what should be kept. Sue Malden from the BBC Library got the job. One of the first problems Sue encountered was the material itself on which Doctor Who was recorded, videotape. The library was called the Film Library, with responsibility for film. And of course, videotape had been used since the very early 60s, in fact, the very late 50s. But videotape was the responsibility of VT Engineering, and the tapes never got out of the basement of Television Centre, nowhere near the archive at that point of view. And so, a big difference, <coughs> presumably, being that whereas film can't really be reused, videotape yeah. could be, and it was a yeah. valuable resource. It was part of the whole problem with videotape. There was a lack of certainty about the life of tape and whether it was a preservation format or not. I, it was seen purely as a production convenience, really. So early programmes that were to be kept or to be sold were transferred to film from the original videotape. And in the case of the <clears throat> Doctor Who episodes, we're talking about the lost Doctor Who episodes, but in fact all the surviving Doctor Who episodes from that period of the 1960s only survive on film. In other words, they're not the original broadcasts, no. they're <clears throat> the copies that were made to sell them abroad Quite or to right. store them. Yeah, yeah, or to store them, yeah. Having negotiated new ways of saving both film and video, Sue then tried to find out more about the gaps in the television archive. I thought the best way of doing it was to think of some kind of iconic series that you would expect for it all to be in the archive. If you, you know, if you just were talking to the man from the moon, he'd, he'd assume it was all there. And Doctor Who seemed to be an obvious series to think of like that. Why? Well, by then it had been running quite a long time, so we'd got nearly 20 years worth of it, so it was going to be a really good test base. It was incredibly popular. And because of the length it had been running, it had touched the lives of so many people. And did you think it had archival value? Or oh, was it just yes. that it was a good test bed for whether the system was, had worked? But uh, implicit in that is that, in my view, it had archival value because of the social impact it had had. So many people had seen it and watched it. it was part of their experience. And it had become a little bit part of the language of the UK in the way there was nobody who didn't know what Doctor Who was. Also, though, it, it had potentially commercial value. One of the roles of the archive is to make sure that the, the stuff the BBC's created is there and available to be exploited in as many ways as possible to help generate income. What did you find out? Well, there were an awful lot of gaps. I was actually astounded. I can't remember. There must have been probably nearly about 200 or so episodes missing out of certainly a good few thousand when we think it had been running from 63 through till, let's say this was about 83 or 84 I was doing this. But there were so many missing, I just couldn't believe it. And not logical either. There'd be one or two missing from a series of six or something like that. And you think, why has that happened? You then had the task of trying to recover some of this missing material. How did you go about doing that? Well, the first thing I did was just get all the stores checked and the shelf. I couldn't think of anything else to do. And, and did things used to turn up like that? Did you, something very been occasionally or? we'd find things, yeah. So it was worth doing. But another part of the job was reaching out and reassuring public key figures and so on, that actually we, the BBC was being responsible. And one of those, one of very specific aspect of that was to work very closely with the National Film and Television Archive. And in doing that, I found that a couple of Doctor Who's listed that weren't in the BBC archive, which um, made me very interested. So I started chatting to the guy there and said, oh, how did you get hold of these? You know, where did they come from? And he explained to me that there was this very nice lady who worked for BBC Enterprises who offered them to him. And BBC Enterprises were the people who sold BBC programmes to other countries? That's right, yeah. They were the commercial part of the BBC, now known as BBC Worldwide. So I sort of tried to contain my enthusiasm and, and excitement and said, oh, what was her name? You know, and scurried off back to uh, the library and made contact with this lady 
just to find out what had been going on, how had she got these and so on. And that's when I learned this whole story about how BBC Enterprises sold productions to foreign broadcasters. They had a huge uh, library of their own for BBC productions that they then used to make copies from to ship out to various different broadcasters all over the world. But this library was one that you, working in the BBC's archives, were not aware of. Blissfully unaware of it. And from there, I could find out how many Doctor Who's, and I kept on with the Doctor Who now because it would be too sort of scattergun if I'd tried looking for hundreds of titles. So I was following my trail of Doctor Who's. I could find out how many they'd originally had to supply copies and where they supplied them to. And then I found out that what the the kind of way of working was, the BBC supplied the copy to a broadcaster who paid for, let's say, two or three transmissions. After that, they had no rights to transmit it. So they were supposed to either destroy it and sign a certificate to prove that they destroyed it, or return it to London, or pass it on to the next country that the programme had been sold to, which was called bicycling. Presumably so it didn't literally go by bicycle. <laughs> no, but you can see the big wheels of the yes, cans absolutely. going round. You could, just, you know. So now there really was a trail to follow, not just for Sue Malden, but also for a handful of Doctor Who enthusiasts and technical experts. Although not an official BBC unit, they're known as the Doctor Who Restoration Team, dedicated to finding and restoring old episodes. Paul Vanessis, a television producer, is one of the team. He takes up the bicycling story. We think we're talking about up to 30 countries. We're not quite sure how they were divided up, but one of the things that we've been trying to do is to piece together the journey that these films have been going on. We're basically looking at the paperwork that currently exists, which helps us tell that story. And then Phil <laughs> takes advantage of that information and tries to follow the trail. Now, some of it makes sense, some of it's very clear, and some of it doesn't make sense. Phil is Phil Morris. He works with Sue Malden and describes himself as an episode hunter. It's a little bit of a mystery trail. Sometimes you think you're going to track a story down to a country only to find out that actually it only stayed a month or so and then it's moved on again. And what you normally find is the paperwork in the country you're going to no longer exists. So there doesn't seem to be a paper trail to chase it along. So it's a little bit of guesswork, a little bit of the existing paperwork we have back in the UK and a little bit of luck, I think. Tell me about some of the places you visit. The most exciting place I've visited, which had the, the largest storage facility, was, uh, it was Zambia Television. We traced the paperwork back and we realised that a lot of Doctor Who episodes had been trafficked through from um, Australia, New Zealand, things had, had moved on, also from other countries had gone to Zambia. And I half expected to find quite a few episodes there. Sadly, that wasn't the case. When I was given the key to the archive, which I was personally given, I'm into this big dusty archive, there was actually no BBC material there on 16mm, sadly. But it did colour that piece of the puzzle in. Zambia is then taken away from the list. So you're given a key. What yes. happened? I felt like Indiana Jones, and I felt like I was just about to find, you know, the Holy Grail behind these doors. Unbelievable feeling, you know. I, Every fan back in England or all around the world, you know, their thoughts were with me. I thought, I'm about to open this door and I'm about to solve the missing Doctor Who's or the missing not only but also, what am I going to find behind these doors? Sadly, it wasn't the case. What was inside? It was full of some 35mm film, one inch videotape, two inch videotape. Just kind of piled up? Oh, it was a mess. Paul, Phil was saying there that he felt almost as if he was, he had all of the fans of Doctor Who behind him standing at his shoulder as he <laughs> yeah. turned the key. Is that a bit of a problem that there is now so much uh, interest and attention and there are so many people enthusiastically willing you to find these missing episodes? I think the interest from the fans is, it's a natural one because I guess like me, they're a bit annoyed that they can't look back into the history of of their favorite tv show and experience those adventures we do get quite a few hoaxes 
some are internet hoaxes but then you get some slightly more sophisticated ones which sometimes come to us directly or they go to the dot who production office in cardiff who usually uh, pass them on to me um it, it's very nice of them but i guess it's because they think that we'll be able to sniff it out and verify whether it's true or not and how, how quickly are you able to tell that these are hoaxes how often do you uh, are your hopes raised by some of these uh, contacts you can usually tell within about five minutes of speaking to whoever is trying to hoax you can you give me an example there was this lady who called and left a message at the bbc in cardiff and they got back to her and she said that her partner had got lots of missing episodes of doctor who that he'd bought 20 years ago and so i gave her a call and she told me that her partner had had bought these missing episodes of Doctor Who from the classified ads in the Doctor Who monthly magazine which was released in, in uh, at her local news agent. Well that first of all didn't make any sense and then she listed what she got and there wasn't one episode that existed every single one of them was a missing Doctor Who and they were all the missing Doctor Who's that you would want to find <laughs> and then she told me that they were all on VHS videotape which of course it's very unlikely that lots and lots and lots of missing doctor who's are all going to turn up on a vhs tape so i told her well this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because i can't imagine all of these doctor who's would be on a vhs videotape bought from the classified ads in a magazine on sale to every doctor who fan in the country <laughs> she said well i'll speak to my partner and uh, give me a call back in half an hour and so i called her back and she said yes only some are on vhs but the rest are on 16 millimeter acetate film i mean you wouldn't call them 16 millimeter acetate film if you didn't know what you were talking about you would just say oh they're old film reels or i'm not quite sure what they are or if you did know what they were you would say they're 16 millimeter optical sound and then she said it isn't a hoax <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course it was, you know. As an episode hunter himself, Paul Vanessis has three notches on his belt. He found the first three episodes from the 1964 story The Reign of Terror in an archive in Cyprus. Phil is still searching. I've laid a lot of rumours to rest. When me and Paul began this, I was there to bring fact to the fiction. There's a lot of rumour and gossip and I wanted the facts bring into it to say, no, look, we've visited these places. So if we ever need to move backwards for any reason, just to check something out, we can do. Is there not though a tiny sense of disappointment that so far it hasn't yielded anything concrete? Well, I would say this. I mean, I don't want to go too much into detail because some things are ongoing, but watch this space and time will reveal that one. That's just one for the fans out there, by the way, they'll pick up on that. The concrete things that have been brought to it up to now for me personally, I think to fans out there, we're bringing fact to the rumour. The rumours are being put to rest. We know exactly. We've been, we've photographed. You know, if it's there, we're going to get it. If it's not there, it doesn't exist there, but we're going to look elsewhere. Um, good morning um, and welcome to Missing in Action. Before I start... Being lost adds to the allure of these episodes. They're a talking point bringing together this group of fans and some of the actors at a convention organised by Phantom Films in a London pub. All kinds of myths get woven into the collective memory. They've become lost classics. Whisper it softly, but I have to admit that one or two which have been recovered turned out not to be that classic after all. But there's no argument here about the significance of the number 108. OK, but the reason why we're here is to um, unfortunately remember, if not celebrate, the 108 darn, the 108 missing episodes of Doctor Who that currently uh, don't reside in the BBC archive for one reason or another. What kind of reminds us really about those 108 is luckily the audio soundtrack still survived. The actors who made those stories are still with us and can recount the tales of what it was like to make Doctor Who and the Myth Makers and the Daleks Master Plan and Web of Fear and some of those lost Doctor Who classics that we can't see. And hopefully in raising awareness, just to keep reminding people that the fact that 108 episodes of Doctor Who are missing, you never know that one day, Doctor Who fans always live in hope that one day one of those episodes or all of those episodes may well be returned. I've enjoyed Doctor Who since I was young. My earliest memories are 
from the mid 60s from Patrick Troughton's era there wasn't any particular reasoning behind the ones that were destroyed and the ones that were kept and the ones that have been found so I don't know that I prefer a missing story as opposed to a story that we have got but both Bill Hartnell and Pat Troughton as the two doctors who lost their stories you know were just very talented actors and, and, and created in their own different ways very believable characters in a sort of entirely unbelievable universe. Do you think any more episodes will ever be found? You're always hopeful, but the, the trouble is the film stock, if they're on film stock, will be deteriorating. And even if something is found now, will it be able to be restored to any sort of watchable level? There's rumours of things in Zimbabwe. <laughs> who knows? But, is yeah, that, that's who knows? The, the popular rumour at the moment, is it? I've read that, yes. But I don't know. I think there's all sorts of wishful thinking about and whether anything will ever come to light, I don't know. Were you surprised when you learnt how many of the episodes didn't exist anymore? I was really surprised that the BBC just destroyed them. I think that the BBC's decision was, was somewhat short-sighted and having destroyed them, they then promptly started trying to find them back again, which was an incredible piece of planning on their part. But then, I suppose, who can predict the future and know what's going to happen? They didn't anticipate the home sale market. If you could choose one of the stories that's missing at the moment, if you could get it back, which would it be? I would imagine Web of Fear, actually. Why? London Underground, the tube, classic story set on Earth, so there's actually things you can actually equate to. I think the one that I would have loved to have seen is Marco Polo, because it's one of the history ones. Every think you read about it, it was meant to be so well done, well put together, well acted, the costumes are fantastic. So that would have been one that would have been well worth seeing. I would go with Power of the Daleks, which is the first Pat Troughton story. I'm back, Doctor, all right. Fools. Stupid fools. You're scared. What can it do? Nothing yet. It was a good story, it's a Dalek story, and Daleks are one of the most powerfully memorable villains that we've seen in Doctor Who. Stop! You see, what does think of this could do for our, our mining program, our processing, packaging, dozens of labour jobs, Governor? It may even supply the end to all this colony's problem. Yes, it will end the colony's problems, because it will end the colony. I am your servant. It spoke. Jeff, did you hear? It, it could actually talk. Do many things less, isn't it? But the thing it does most efficiently is exterminate I human beings. Servant. It destroys them. I without am mercy, without conscience. I it destroys am them utterly. Completely. I am your it destroys servant. them. I'm Deborah Watson, actress, been in Doctor Who, which I'm known for, of course. Once you're in Doctor Who, you are never forgotten. And you weren't just in Doctor Who, you were the part assist- of Doctor Who. I was, actually, yes, I was the assistant to Patrick Troughton. I was Victoria Waterfield. She was a Victorian miss. Her father was killed and she was captured by the Daleks. And so the doctor and Jamie actually came to rescue me. She had no family, and so the doctor said, you better come on board with us in the TARDIS, and we'll take you on our travels. And my year in Who is actually named the Monster Era, because I met so many monsters, just extraordinary. But Victoria did scream quite a lot. <laughs> And I got the nickname Leather Lungs, because my scream, my goodness me, you know, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't your scream famously actually kill off a monster? Yes, it was Fury from the Deep, it was a seaweed monster. I'm Bernard Kay. I'm here doing a Doctor Who symposium. When Doctor Who first started, nobody expected it to become a great big international thing. It was a job. You got a call from your agent. Some idiots come up with the idea, you know, of a time-travelling police box, which is bigger inside than outside. Would you like to do it? Yes, of course I would. 
you were saying in there that William Hartnell felt rather resentful that he'd been a big figure in film and then he was reduced to doing a, a weekly tea time television series. I'm sure that's the way he saw it. He was bitter, yes. I just thought it was a pity he, he really despised the work he was doing. You could see it actually, he fluffed a lot and he played the old man with you, which honestly I would have been ashamed to do in rep. But there are millions who will disagree with every word I've just said. You know? The Crusade, you had a very, very major role. I loved that, playing Saladin, yes. Yes, I, I just loved it. All is now clear to me except the lady's presence. Great Sultan, this woman can be made to entertain you. I can have a dance on hot coals, run a gauntlet of sharp tip swords. No! Die for your pleasure. What do you say to that? It sounds like the punishment for a fool. It does. And who here is the most foolish? He was a fighting man, but he, before anything he was a, a Muslim of honour. And so he was able to show this forgiving side. Jackie Hill, who, who was the, the doctor's companion then, came to me after we taped one of the episodes of the Crusades, and she said, do you know Bernard? I, well, I have to say, I, I realise you're a real actor. And I thought, oh, God, you know. Are you afraid of me? Uh, no. You're not of these lands, yet you seem to be a stranger to Sir William. I'm a traveller. I came with three friends. We arrived in the wood. You rode into the wood? No. You walked into it? Not that either. You arrived? Yes. In a box. In a box? Ah, you were carried into the wood. Yes. Please talk. It helps me to consider what I have to do with you. Well, I could say that I'm from another world. A world ruled by insects. And before that, we were in Rome at the time of Nero. Before that, we were in England far, far into the future. Now I understand you and your friends, your players, entertainers. With little value in an exchange of prisoners with the English king, brother. This is a trivial affair. I do not know why you waste your time. I cannot dispense life and death lightly. Bernard Kay in episode one of the 1965 story The Crusade. And that episode, called The Lion, brings us to perhaps the most remarkable rescue story in the Doctor Who archive. By the late 90s, it felt as if no more missing episodes would be recovered. There'd been some great finds in some strange places, an episode in a Mormon church, for example. But many, including Sue Morden, thought that might be it. I remember doing an interview uh, while I was still working at the BBC, so that's maybe about 10 years ago, and, and I said, yes, I, I think there's no chance of finding any more. We've tried everywhere and so on. And then within a year... Um, we were approached by someone who'd found one in New Zealand. And that was a, a very complicated story. The New Zealand Broadcasting Corporation had a big clear out of their film archives in much the same way that the BBC did. They basically thought we can't afford to store all this film prints anymore. So they basically loaded up a truck and took the whole lot of these film cans to the dump. And allegedly a film collector got wind of this and arranged to commandeer a number of these these film cans and take them home for his own private use. That's Paul Schoons, a Doctor Who enthusiast from New Zealand. As we understand it, it passes through the hands of maybe a couple of collectors and is actually stored in a shed on a farm for, for a number of years. One of the quite remarkable things is although given all the publicity that, that missing episodes from the BBC have actually had over the years, None of these film collectors in New Zealand ever seemed to cotton on to the fact that this was a missing episode or indeed that the BBC were missing anything. So this film was saved from the dump in the early 70s, passed around for 20 years or so, spent a while on a farm and then ended up in the hands of the collector Bruce Grenville. Once there, it came to the notice of Paul and his friend Neil Lambis. I ran into an old friend of mine, Cornelius Stone, in a Auckland comic store and we were talking about Bruce Grenville and his collection and I said to Corn, he doesn't have any Doctor Who, does he? Corn thought about it for a minute and then remembered, yeah, actually he does. And I sort of went, what? And then began a process of getting in touch with Bruce Grenville. And it was 
very, very interesting to discover that it indeed was the line. The funny thing for me is that prior to this, and I'm sure Neil will back me up on this, he's often come up with these theories about there being a missing episode somewhere and, you know, he might have seen a macro terror at school or there might be an episode of Highlanders that his, his friend might have seen at some point. So all these wild and fanciful theories that have come to nothing have been bandied about by Neil over the years. So by the time that Neil rings me up and goes, I think I found a missing episode, it's almost cry wolf situation. I really didn't have any real expectation that we were actually going to see a missing episode. So tell me about that visit to Bruce Granville's home. Part of me was going, oh, this is going to be another false lead. It's going to be something we've already got. It's going to be an episode of Steptoe and Son, which will still be great, but it's... The only yeah. reason you asked me to come along, I think, was because I had a video camera. That's right, yeah. We, we <laughs> didn't right. think at the time that Bruce would necessarily let us take the film print mm. away or that we would ever get to see it mm. twice. So Neil had actually asked Bruce, and Bruce had very kindly agreed, could we point a video camera at the screen while he was projecting it? Mm and take a copy on VHS of the film because this might be the only time that he would permit us to screen it. We didn't know how agreeable Bruce would be. So the film uh, projector starts whirring away. You see those familiar titles. Still at that point, presumably because those titles were on lots and lots of episodes, still no way of knowing whether or not this was a recovery, a find. Indeed. We were waiting for the opening shot because we've seen virtually every episode of Doctor Who a thousand times and uh, the credits finish and then we see the TARDIS materialise in a forest somewhere. Very quickly the words, the lion came up on screen mm. and I think at that point, and bear in mind that Neil and I at this point didn't think that we would necessarily ever get to see it again and we had the video camera going which was also recording the sound so we really didn't want to say anything over the top of our what might be unique video copy so we were like doing this sort of silent mime at each other of, of absolute joy. Of course. Did you hear what that man called? Called him? Saracen. Malik Wick. Yes. That was the name the Saracens had for King Richard, Fjord de Leon. Malik Rick. So we're in the Holy Land? Oh, uh, hmm? He's trying to say something. What? Uh, he's got a very bad wound here. Uh, yeah. He was not the king. Not the king? The, the belt. Hmm? Get the belt. This belt? This belt? We didn't want to get too excited in front of him because there was the risk, of course, that he might go, oh, I've got something unique, I'm never going to let anyone see it, or I'm going to charge an astronomical amount of money. To Bruce's credit, he turned out to be very agreeable and, and very sort of interested in the BBC getting it back. But the BBC officially uh, took a slightly tougher line. The BBC weren't exactly um, set up to know how to deal with missing episode fines. It, it was a rare enough instance that they hadn't really got a policy developed. We were approached by the auction house for permission to allow the guy to sell it. So we went kind of apoplectic and said, well, first of all, BBC owns a copyright on that. So we would like to have it back to have a copy to go into the archive. But of course the guy who bought it physically owns what he bought. He doesn't have any of the rights in the content, but he owns the can and the roll of film. So we can't stop him doing whatever he wants to do with that, but we would love to have a copy back, which he agreed to do, and that was great. Sue Morden, who worked at the BBC archive. When all the issues had been ironed out and nervous Paul Schoons went to collect the world's only known copy of the Doctor Who episode, the lion. I walked away up the drive trembling in my hands going, is he going to let me go? Is he going to come rushing after me and grab it back? But um, and I, I uh, FedExed it off to the BBC the following morning. How did that feel? It was a bit nerve-wracking having it in my hands because I was thinking, well, if I trip over or if, if something happens to it, if I lose it at any point before it's dispatched, I'm, I'm going to sort of become the prior of fandom. I'm, <laughs> you know, Doctor Who fans will hate me forever having lost this episode so near and yet so far. So, that, so once it had actually got away on FedEx, or rather once Steve had confirmed that he'd received it on FedEx, that, that was the point of relief. Take me back to that wood, Sir William, and I'll answer all your questions. You ask for the impossible, very likely. Is it so impossible? Today it is. A couple of years after it had been found, I saw a letter that was written by the film director Alvin Rakoff, who had been married to a actress called Jacqueline Hill, who had played the Doctor's companion, Barbara, for the first two years of the show. 
and she had died of cancer in the early 90s and he just said that it was incredible to see the missing episode because he could see his wife young and acting and she was alive and i think if anything else finding that episode for me anyway was we gave him his the love of his life back for 20 minutes what am i to say of you to the heathen how can i explain you to them well to them you're king richard so who would travel with richard the queen would not the princess yes you shall be joanna my sister and help me in my lies very well i seem to have gained a brother and a title what is more a friend i'm grateful for that so will we find any more of the lost episodes of doctor who when i spoke to him the episode hunter phil morris sounded optimistic if not, we still have the audio, thanks to the amateur devotion of people like Graham Strong and the professional skill of Mark Ayres. I was just merely recording these for my own personal use and uh, to find out 30 odd years later that there was a massive worldwide Doctor Who following, which I knew nothing about. But yes, I'm, I'm pleased that other people can listen to the stories cleaned up by Mark as they would have been heard originally. You could have at some point have just said, ah, oh, this is all cluttering up space in my... And ditch them, yes. But I, I, I'm a hoarder. And thank heaven some people had recorded these programmes. I mean, kids now who are watching their DVDs of their favourite programmes over and over again cannot imagine what it was like to have that anticipation for the next episode that we had as kids back then. And yes, you did sort of cling on to these recordings for programs that you're enthusiastic about and i think i can testify that because a bit of a confession here back about 20 years ago when when i was uh, in my early teens and mid-teens i can remember sitting there with a really bad cassette recording of a very old doctor who episode probably wasn't one of yours graham don't worry uh, and copying it onto another cassette by which time it was almost unlistenable to why on earth did people like you and me do that mark looking back it seems balmy and they were terrible i had tapes in my collection which you put on it was just a sea of noise but you listened to it because it was Doctor Who when it came on you knew it was on because it sounded like nothing else on television when Doctor Who came on you knew it had come on Archive on 4, Doctor Who The Lost Episodes was presented by Sean Lay. The producer in Bristol was Chris Ledyard and the researcher was Mark Harrison. And Doctor Who The Lost TV episodes are available to buy as a CD or download. Incidentally, since that programme was made in 2009, nine missing episodes of Doctor Who were found at a TV station in Nigeria, including most of the classic episode The Web of Fear. It was the largest haul of episodes in the last 30 years.